Hello guys, welcome back to another video. Today we are going to cover this book, How to Win Friends and Influence People by Dale Carnick. In this book we will cover four main points. The first point is make friends quickly and easily. The second point is win people over to your way of thinking. The third point is improve your conversation skills and become more entertaining. The fourth point is acquire new clients and customers. So let's begin with this book. Uh, for the beginning I would recommend this book to everyone that is on self-improvement journey. This book will help you a lot. Social skills are very important in our day-to-day -day life. So, if you are on the start of your journey, uh, or if you haven't read this book yet, I would highly recommend it for you to read it. Let's talk about 8 main points you will get from this book. So, the first one is, make friends quickly and easily. Increase your popularity. Win people to your way of thinking. Increase your influence, your prestige your ability to get things done. Handle complaints, avoid arguments, keep your human contact smooth and pleasant. Become a better speaker, a more entertaining conversationalist. Arouse enthusiasm among your associates. Principle number one, don't criticize, condemn or complain. Instead of condemning people, Let's try to understand them. Let's try to figure out why they do what they do. That's a lot more profitable and intriguing than criticism. And it breeds sympathy, tolerance and kindness. To know all is to forgive all. As Dr. Johnson said, God himself, sir, does not propose to judge a man until the end of his days. Why should you and why should I? Principle number two, give honest and sincere appreciation. Emerson said, every man I met is my superior. In some way, in that way, I learn of him. If that was true of Emerson, isn't it likely to be a thousand times more true of you and me? Let's cease thinking of our accomplishments, our wants, let's try to figure out the other person's good points. Then forget flattery, give honest, sincere appreciation, be hearty in your approbation and lavish in your praise. And people will cherish your words and treasure them, repeat them years after you have forgotten them. Principle number three. Arouse in the other person an eager want. William Winter once remarked that self-expression is the dominant necessity of human nature. Why can't we adopt this same psychology to business dealings? When we have a brilliant idea, instead of making others think it's ours, why not let them cook and steer the idea themselves? They will then regard it as their own. They will like it, and maybe eat a couple of helpings of it. Remember, first arouse in the other person an eager want. He who can do this has the whole world with him. He who cannot walks a lonely way. Principle number four. Become generally interested in other people. If you want others to like you, if you want to develop real friendships, if you want to help others at the same time as you help yourself, keep this principle in mind. Principle number five and one of the most important principles, smile. It costs nothing but creates much. It enriches those who receive without impoverishing those who give. It happens in a flash and the memory of it sometimes lasts forever. None are so rich they can get along without it and none so poor 
but are richer for its benefits. It creates happiness in the home, fosters goodwill in the business, and is the countersign of friends. It is rest to the weary, daylight to the discouraged, sunshine to the sad, and nature's best antidote for trouble. Yet it cannot be bought, begged, borrowed, or stolen, for it is something that is no earthly good to anybody till it's given away. For nobody needs a smile so much as those who have none left to give. Principle number six. Remember that a person's name is to that person the sweetest, the most important sound in any language. The name sets the individual apart. It makes him or her unique among all others. The information we are imparting or the request we are making takes on a special importance when we approach the situation with the name of the individual. From the waitress to the senior executive, the name will work magic as we deal with others. Principle number seven, be a good listener, encourage others to talk about themselves. Remember that the people you are talking to are a hundred times more interested in themselves and their wants and problems than they are in you and your problems. A boil on one's neck interest one more than a 40 earthquakes in Africa. Think of that the next time you start a conversation. Principle number eight, talk in terms of the other person's interests. Everyone who was ever a guest of Theodore Roosevelt was astonished at the range and diversity of his knowledge. Whether his visitor was a cowboy or a rough rider, a New York politician or a diplomat, Roosevelt knew what to say. And how was it done? The answer was simple. Whenever Roosevelt expected a visitor, he sat up late the night before reading up on the subject in which he knew his guest was particularly interested. For Roosevelt knew, as all leaders know, that the royal road to a person's heart is to talk about the things he or she treasures the most. Principle number nine, make the other person feel important and do it sincerely. Chris was a very quiet, shy boy lacking in self-confidence, the kind of a student that often does not receive the attention he deserves. I also teach on advanced class that had grown to be somewhat of a status symbol and a privilege for a student to have earned the right to be in it. On Wednesday, Chris was delightedly working at his desk. I really felt there was a hidden fire deep inside him. I asked Chris he would like to be in advanced class. How I wish I could express the look in Chris's face, the emotions in that shy 14-year-old boy trying to hold back his tears. Who? Me, Mr. Rowland? Am I good enough? Yes, Chris, you are good enough. Principle number 10. The only way to get the best out of argument is to avoid it. If you argue, and rankle and contradict, you may achieve a victory sometimes, but it will be an empty victory because you will never get your opponent's goodwill. Here lies the body of William J., who died maintaining his right of way. He was right, dead right, as he speed along, but he is just as dead as if he were wrong. Principle number 11. Show respect for the other person's opinions. Never say you are wrong. When Theodore Roosevelt was in the White House, he confessed that if he could be right 75% of the time, he would reach the highest measure of his expectation. If that was the highest rating that one of the most distinguished men of the 20th century could hope to obtain, what about you and me? If you can be sure of being right only 55% of the time, you can go down to Wall Street and make a million dollars a day. 
if you can be sure of being right even 55% of the time, why should you tell other people they are wrong? Principle number 12. If you are wrong, admit it quickly and emphatically. When we are right, let's try to win people gently and tactfully to our way of thinking. And when we are wrong, and that will be surprisingly often, if we are honest with ourselves, let's admit our mistakes quickly and with enthusiasm. Not only will that technique produce astonishing results, but believe it or not, it's a lot more fun under the circumstances than trying to defend oneself. Remember the old proverb, by fighting you never get enough, but by yielding you get more than you expected. Principle number 13. Begin in a friendly way. It is an old and true maxim that a drop of honey catches more flies than a gallon of gold. So with men, if you would win a man to your cause, first convince him that you are his sincere friend. Therein is a drop of honey that catches his heart, which say what you will, is the great high road to his reason. Principle number 14. Get the other person saying yes, yes immediately. The next time we are tempted to tell someone he or she is wrong, let's remember old Socrates and ask a gentle question. A question that will get the yes, yes response. The Chinese have a proverb pregnant with the age-old wisdom of the Orient. He who treads softly goes far. They have spent 5,000 years studying human nature, those cultured Chinese, and they have garnered a lot of perspicacy. He who trades softly goes far. Principle number 15. Let the other person do a great deal of thinking. Most people trying to win others to their way of thinking do too much talking themselves. Let the other people talk themselves out. They know more about their business and problems than you do. So ask them questions. Let them tell you a few things. If you disagree with them, you may be tempted to interrupt. But don't. It's dangerous. They won't pay attention to you while they still have a lot of ideas of their own crying for expression. So listen patiently and with an open mind. Be sincere about it. Encourage them to express their ideas fully. Principle number 16. Let the other person feel that idea is his or hers. Don't you have much more faith in ideas that you discover for yourself than in ideas that are handed to you on a silver platter? If so, isn't it bad judgment to try to ram your opinions down the throats of other people? Isn't it wiser to make suggestions and let the other person think out the conclusion? Principle number 17. Try honestly to see things from the other person's point of view. Remember that other people may be totally wrong, but they don't think so. Don't condemn them. Any fool can do that. Try to understand them. Only wise, tolerant, exceptional people even try to do that. There is a reason why the other man thinks and acts as he does. Ferret out that reason, and you have the key to his actions, perhaps to his personality. Try honestly to put yourself in his place. If you say to yourself, how would I feel, how would I react if I were in his shoes, you will save yourself time and irritation. For by becoming interested in the cause, we are less likely to dislike the effect. And in addition, you will sharply increase your skill in human relationships. Principle number 18. Be sympathetic with the other person's ideas and desires. Would you like to have a magic phrase that would stop arguments, eliminate ill feelings, create goodwill and make the other person listen attentively? Yes? All right, here it is. I don't blame you one iota for feelings as you do. If I were you, 
I would undoubtedly feel just as you do. An answer like that will soften the most cantankerous old cause alive. And you can say that and be 100% sincere. Because if you were the other person, you, of course, would feel just as he does. Principle number 19. Appeal to the nobler motives. My visit to each customer was likewise to collect a bill long past due. A bill that we knew was absolutely right, but I didn't say a word about that. I explained I had called to find out what it was the company had done or failed to do. I made it clear that until I had heard the customer's story, I had no opinion to offer. I told him the company made no claims to being infallible. I told him I was interested only in his car and that he knew more about his car than anyone else in the world, that he was the authority on the subject. I let him talk and I listened to him with all the interest and sympathy that he wanted and had expected. Finally, when the customer was in a reasonable mood, I put the whole thing up to his sense of fair play. I appealed to the nobler motives. First I said, I want you to know I also feel that this matter has been badly mishandled. You've been inconvinced and annoyed and irritated by one of our representatives. That should never have happened. I am sorry and as a representative of the company I apologize. As I sat here and listened to your side of the story, I could not help being impressed by your fairness and patience. And now, because you are fair-minded and patient, I am going to ask you to do something for me. It's something that you can do better than anyone else. Something you know more about than anyone else. Here's your bill. I know it's safe for me to ask you to adjust it. Just as you would do if you were the president of my company. I'm going to leave it all up to you. Whatever you say goes. Did he adjust the bill? He certainly did. And got quite a kick out of it. The bills ranged from $150 to $400. But did the customer give himself the best of it? Yes, one of them did. But the other five all gave the company the best of it. And here's the cream of the whole thing. We delivered new cars to all six of these customers within the next two years. Principle number 20. Dramatize your ideas. Experts in window displays know the power of dramatization. For example, the manufacturers of a new rat poison gave dealers a window display that included two live rats. The week the red were shown, sales zoomed to five times their normal rate. Television commercials abound with examples of the use of dramatic techniques in selling products. Sit down one evening in front of your television, set and analyze what the advertisers do in each of their presentations. You will note how an antacid medicine changes the color of the acid in a test tube while its competitor doesn't. How one brand of soap or detergents gets a greasy shirt clean when the other brand leaves it gray. You will see a car maneuver around a series of turns and curves far better than just being told about it. Happy faces will show contentment with a variety of products. All of these dramatize for the viewer the advantages offered by whatever is being sold and they do get people to buy them. Principle number 21. Throw down a challenge. Let Charles Schwab say it in his own words. The way to get things done, says Schwab, is to stimulate competition. I do not mean in a sordid money-getting way, but in the desire to excel. The desire to excel, the challenge, throwing down the gauntlet, an infallible way of appealing to people of spirit. Without a challenge, Theodore Roosevelt would have never been a president of the United States. Principle number 22. Begin with praise and honest appreciation. 
We recently hired a young lady as a tailor trainee. Her contract with our customers was very good. She was accurate and efficient in handling individual transactions. The problem developed at the end of the day when it was time to balance out. The head teller came to me and strongly suggested that I fire this woman. She's holding up everyone else because she is so slow in balancing out. I shown her over and over, but she can get it. She's got to go. The next day I observed her working quickly and accurately when handling the normal everyday transactions. And she was very pleasant with our customers. It didn't take long to discover why she had trouble balancing out. After the office closed, I went over to talk with her. She was obviously nervous and upset. I praised her for being so friendly and outgoing with the customers and complimented her for the accuracy and speed used in that work. I then suggested we review the procedure we use in balancing the cash drawer. Once she realized I had confidence in her, she easily followed my suggestions and soon mastered this function. We have had no problems with her since then. Begin with praise is like the dentist who begin his work with Novocaine. The patient still gets a drilling, but the Novocaine is pain killing. A leader will use, begin with praise and honest appreciation. Principle number 23. Call attention to people's mistakes indirectly. Charles Schwab was passing through one of his steel mills one day at noon when he came across some of his employees smoking. Immediately above their heads was a sign that said no smoking. Did Schwab point to the sign and say can't you read? Oh no, not Schwab. He walked over to the men, handed each one a cigar and said I will appreciate it boys if you will smoke this on the outside. They knew that he knew that they had broken a rule and they admired him because he said nothing about it and gave them a little present and made them feel important. Couldn't keep from loving a man like that, could you? Principle number 24. Talk about your own mistakes before criticizing the other person. My niece Josephine Karnick had come to New York to be my secretary. She was 19, had graduated from high school three years previously and her business experience was a trifle more than zero. She became one of the most proficient secretaries west of Sus, but in the beginning she was, well, susceptible to improvement. One day when I started to criticize her, I said to myself, just a minute, Dale Karnick, just a minute. You are twice as old as Josephine. You have had 10,000 times as much business experience. How can you possibly expect her to have your, your viewpoint, your judgment, your initiative? Mediocre thought, they may be. And just a minute, Dale, what were you doing at 19? Remember the as nine mistakes and blunders you made. Remember the time you did this and that. After thinking the matter over, Honestly and imperately, I concluded that Josephine's batting average at 19 was better than mine had been. And that, I'm sorry to confess, isn't paying Josephine much of a compliment. So after that, when I wanted to call Josephine's attention to a mistake, I used to begin by saying, you have made a mistake, Josephine, but the Lord knows it's no worse than many I have made. You were not born with judgment that comes only with experience and you are better than I was at your age. Principle number 25. Ask questions instead of giving direct orders. When Ian McDonald of Johannesburg, South Africa, the general manager of a small manufacturing plant specializing in precision machine parts, had the opportunity to accept a very large order, he was convinced that he would not meet the promised delivery date. The work already scheduled in the shop and the short competition time needed for this order made, it seems impossible for him to accept the order. Instead of pushing his people to accelerate their work and rush the order through, 
he called everybody together, explained the situation to them and told them how much it would mean to the company and to them if they could make it possible to produce the order on time. Then he started asking questions. Is there anything we can do to handle this order? Can anyone think of different ways of processing it through the shop that will make it possible to take the order? Is there any way to adjust our hours or personnel assignments that would help? The employees came up with many ideas and insisted that he take the order. They approached it with a we can do it attitude. And the order was accepted, produced and delivered on time. An effective leader will use, ask questions instead of giving a direct orders. Principle number 26. Let the other person save face. Even if we are right and the other person is definitely wrong, we only destroy ego by causing someone to lose face. The legendary French aviation pioneer and author Antoine wrote, I have no right to say or do anything that diminishes a man in his own eyes. What matters is not what I think of him, but what he thinks of himself. Hurting a man in his dignity is a crime. Principle number 27. I will have to read this one. Praise the slightest improvement and praise every improvement. Be hearty in your approbation and lavish in your praise. Pete Barlow was an old friend of mine. He had a dog and pony act and spent his life training with circuses and vaudeville shows. I love to watch Pete train new dogs for his act. I noticed that the moment a dog showed the slightest improvement, Pete petted and praised him and gave him meat and made a great to-do about it. That's nothing new. Animal trainers have been using that same technique for centuries. Why I wonder don't we use the same common sense when trying to change people that we use when trying to change dogs? Why don't we use meat instead of a whip? Why don't we use praise instead of condemnation? Let us praise even the slightest improvement. That inspires the other person to keep on improving. Principle number 28. Give another person a fine reputation to live up to. When Mrs. Ruth Hopkins, a fourth grade teacher in Brooklyn, New York, looked at her class rooster the first day of school, her excitement and joy of starting a new term was tingled with an anxiety. In her class, this year she would have Tommy T, the school's most notorious bad boy. His third grade teacher had constantly complained about Tommy to colleagues, the principal and anyone else who would listen. He was not just mischievous, he caused serious discipline problems in the class, picked fights with the boys, teased the girls, was fresh to the teacher and seemed to get worse as he grew older. His only redeeming feature was his ability to learn rapidly and master the school work easily. Mrs. Hopkins decided to face the Tommy problem immediately. When she greeted her new students, she made little comments to each one of them. Rose, that's pretty dress you're wearing. Alicia, I hear you draw beautifully. When she came to Tommy, she looked him straight in the eyes and said, Tommy, I understand you are a natural leader. I'm going to depend on you to help me make this class the best class in the fourth grade this year. She reinforced this over the first few days by complimenting Tommy on everything he did and commenting on how this showed what a good student he was. With that reputation to live up to, even a nine-year-old couldn't let her down. And he didn't. If you want to excel in that difficult leadership role of changing the attitude or behavior of others, use. Give the other person a fine reputation to live up to. Principle number 29. Use encouragement. Make the fault seem easy to correct. A bachelor friend of mine, about 40 years old, became engaged and his fiance persuaded him to take some belted dancing lessons. The Lord knows I needed dancing lessons, he confessed as he told me the story. For I danced just as I did when I first started 20 years ago. The first teacher I engaged probably told me the truth. She said I was all wrong. 
I would just have to forget everything and begin all over again, but then took the heart out of me. I had no initiative to go on, so I quit her. The next teacher may have been lying, but I liked it. She said that my dancing was a bit old-fashioned, perhaps, but the fundamentals were all right, and she assured me I wouldn't have any trouble learning a few new steps. The first teacher had discouraged me by emphasizing my mistakes. This new teacher did the opposite. She kept praising the things I did right and minimizing my errors. You have a natural sense of rhythm, she assured me. You really are a natural born dancer. Now my common sense tells me that I always have been and always will be a fourth rate dancer. Yet deep in my heart, I still like to think that maybe she meant it. To be sure, I was paying her to say it, but why bring that up? At any rate, I know I am a better dancer than I would have been if she hadn't told me I had a natural sense of rhythm. That encouraged me. That gave me hope. That made me want to improve. Principle number 30. Make the other person feel happy about doing the thing that you suggest. Be sincere. Do not promise anything that you cannot deliver. Forget about the benefits to yourself and concentrate on the benefits to the other person. Know exactly what it is you want the other person to do. Be empathetic. Ask yourself, what is it the other person really wants? Consider the benefits that person will receive from doing what you suggest. Match those benefits to the other person's wants. When you make your request, put it in a form that will convey the other person the idea that he personally will benefit. We could give a court order like this. John, we have customers coming in tomorrow and I need the stock room cleaned out. So swap it out, put the stocks in neat piles on the shelves and polish the counter. Or we would express the same idea by showing John the benefits he will get from doing this task. John, we have a job that should be completed right away. If it's done now, we won't be faced with it later. I'm bringing some customers in tomorrow to show our facilities. I would like to show them the stock room but it is in a poor shape. If you could swap it out, put the stocks in neat piles on the shelves and polish the counter, it would make us look efficient and you will have done your part to provide a good company image. So guys, this is the end of the video. I hope you liked it. Again, if you want to buy the book How to Win Friends and Influence People, I would highly recommend it. Try to implement every little thing from this book in your day-to-day -day life and you will see the difference in your conversational skills. Thank you again for watching and if you like this video please like and subscribe. I will make more videos like this in the future and remember do the one thing today that will make you a better person tomorrow.